Inshallah, today we're going to be continuing our series. I guess it was meant to be a more frequent series, uh, but unfortunately it's been six months since the last uh, time we had this, and exactly six months today. And so the idea in this series is for us to get to know more about the Qur'an. Oftentimes we learn a lot of the content that is within the Qur'an. We'll learn about the different themes that occur within the Qur'an. But one of the things that we often miss out on is getting to know what the Qur'an is like. What was the revelation of the Qur'an like? What were the different peculiarities and uh, unique aspects and features of the Qur'an? And for today's um, lecture, we're going to talk about two particular features of the Qur'an. And those are the occasions of revelation and the different ways in which the Qur'an has been organized. So we'll talk about these two, two uh, features of the Qur'an, inshallah, one by one. We'll go through a couple of slides, we'll look at some examples from the Qur'an as well, where these features are manifested and, and discussed by the scholars. And inshallah, we'll take it from there. So the first discussion, and we'll jump right into it, is this concept called the occasions of revelation. In Arabic, they call this asbab al nuzul Asbab means the reasons for nuzul, for revelation. So what is this talking about generally, and why is this important before we jump into some of the more details? Oftentimes we'll have narrations from the, from the companions, from the early generations, talking about how a particular ayah was revealed at a particular time, or in a particular event. Such and such thing happened, and then this ayah came down. Or such and such event happened, and the surah came down. So that's called a sabab un nuzul and the plural of it is asbab un nuzul So that's what we're talking about here. One of the important questions that comes up that's more practical and more relevant to our understanding of the Qur'an is, well, if the Qur'an, was re Qur'an revealed a particular ayah about a particular individual or a particular event that happened in the life of the Prophet wasallam, does that mean that that's the only thing it applies to? Or can we extend it to any other circumstance that that wording of the Qur'an fits in, that phrasing of the Qur'an, that meaning of the Qur'an fits in. So these are some of the more practical uh, ramifications of this discussion that we'll get into inshallah. And we'll see some examples of uh, where we have an established, authenticated uh, sabab un nuzul of a particular passage from the Qur'an. So, what is an occasion of revelation? The scholars define it as a statement, an action, or a question from those that were alive during revelation due to which some revelation came addressing that situation. And that's the simple definition of it. Oftentimes, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, for me personally, this topic has always fascinated me, but I never got a really clear definition as a kid. I was just like, you know, always asking around, and people are like, yeah, you know, you, you hear this happening, and then the Qur'an comes down, or somebody asks a question, and the Qur'an comes down. But no one ever gave me, like, a really, like, straightforward definition. When I, when I got this definition, I was like, this is amazing, mashallah. Uh, I don't know, maybe I just nerd out a little bit too much about definitions. An example of this is Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his Sahih collection, narrates from the companion Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, that there were some people from Yemen that were coming to do hajj without any preparations. And they said, well, we're just exhibiting tawakkul. We're having proper trust in Allah. And this is a time to exhibit that tawakkul. And when they arrived in Mecca, they asked some people, and they said, well, this is what we're doing. And then at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re revealed the ayah uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى Take provisions for the journey. Surely the best provision is righteousness. So it kind of affirms the spirit of what these people were doing, where they were preparing themselves spiritually. They were preparing themselves in terms of their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, so at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them first, make sure you do take your material provisions as well. Everything that we have in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to take the material means and then trust in Allah. So it was like a subtle correction of their concept of tawakkul. And this is something that if I had just read this ayah, for example, and I'm reading the translation, I see, oh, okay. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about hajj. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says during the conversation about hajj, take provisions for your journey. Surely the best provision is righteousness. I get a basic meaning out of it. But when I know this context, it just gives it a deeper color. And now I, I will always remember that message a lot deeper than before. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow 
uh, those who went to Hajj to accept their may Allah Taala accept their Hajj, and those who have not been may Allah Taala allow them to uh, make this uh, sacred pilgrimage to uh, Mecca and uh, have an accepted journey. Amin ya rabbal alamin. So these occasions of revelation are going to be happening when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive, as the revelation is coming down. Sometimes you have stories being addressed in the Quran that happened before revelation, that happened before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For example, we have the story of the elephant uh, in Surah Al-Fil, when the people from Yemen under Abraha they gathered a huge army with elephants and they start try to attack the Kaaba. That whole story is addressed in Surah Al-Fil. But that story is not the occasion of revelation because that happened before revelation. And similarly, all other stories in the Quran, uh, stories of righteous people, stories of prophets, stories of evil people from the past, any stories that are mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those won't be considered occasions of revelation in that sense. However, Again, similar to these occasions of revelation, the more we learn about that story and that back, backdrop and what was going on and the context, that message has so much more depth to it. It just like pierces a little bit more and then stays there for a little bit longer. And then when we come across situations in our lives that we connect to a real individual, a real thing that happened in, in history, we're going to be able to make that connection much more directly. And so this is one of the minor differences, and just to mention there, that stories are not exactly occasions of revelation, but we can get wisdom out of both of them in a similar way. So what are some benefits of knowing the occasion of revelation? We've talked about one, about you know, building color, but we'll, we'll talk about a couple other ones here as well. The first benefit is that it helps us to know the intended specific meaning. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean in this ayah? So if we quickly go back to the previous example we looked at, take provision for your journey. It's a general meaning, right? I can apply that, and if I take it out of the context of the, the previous ayat, I can just take that phrase and I'll be like, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me to take provisions for my journey across the country, for my journey to visit my parents, for my journey to visit family, etc., etc. Whatever the journey is, Allah told me to take provisions. So that's a general meaning. But first... I'm going to start off with what is a specific meaning intended. Because someone might come up when, and this happens nowadays, unfortunately, quite often. Someone will come and they'll say, well, you know, technically this word that I'm reading in translation, provision, I think it means this. Well, it doesn't technically matter what you think or I think. It matters how the Arabs understood that word that is in the Quran, how the scholars preserved the meaning of that word across the generations to get to us. And so we have to start off from that point of understanding what is the specific meaning of this phrase that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us here. And so this uh, is one of the things that, uh, for example, comes up in Surah Al-Tukhan, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرْتَقِبْ يَوْمَ تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُبِينٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, watch out for the day when the sky brings forth clouds of smoke for all to see. It's a very vivid image. And this is talking about closer to the day of judgment. So at the time of the companions, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had passed away, there was uh, one of those preachers who you know, would like stand up and speak to people, motivate people. And he was trying to explain this verse to people. And he gave this description, and he gave more detail than this, and he said, well, it's going to be the smoke that comes and gathers everyone's souls, and at, right at the end, as the souls are leaving the body, it will be like phlegm coming out of your mouth, as if you sneezed and some phlegm came out, that's how it's going to gather all the souls. So now somebody was there in that gathering who heard this happening. And they went to the senior companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is one of the highest authorities when it comes to the Qur'an and understanding the Qur'an and the meaning of the Qur'an. And they mentioned this to him. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was not very happy with this. He said, I was there listening to the Prophet ﷺ reciting so many verses of the Qur'an. I understand the verses of the Qur'an in a way that I don't know anybody else in the world understands them. He said, let me tell you when this verse came down. And he gives a context to this verse. 
He says in Mecca, there was a time when the Quraysh were persecuting the Muslims intensely. And during that period, at one point the Prophet ﷺ made dua against them. And he said, Ya Allah, make them see suffering similar to the suffering that Yusuf ﷺ's people saw in terms of a drought, in terms of not having enough food. And so for some time, the people of Quraysh went through that struggle. So much so that people were so hungry they would eat bones because that's all they had left. And people would be so weak that if they tried to look up because they were just like, you know, kind of on the ground, it's like the heat of the desert. You can imagine it's just a very difficult environment to be in. I mean, it's hot outside today and I think if I sat there for like 30 minutes, I would probably struggle to get up. So when you're in that heat and you don't have a lot of nutrition within you, what happens when you look up too fast to the sky? You start to get a little dizzy. You can't really see super clearly. And so people would say, when I look up at the sky, it's as if there's smoke. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is one of the very miraculous things about the, the wording of the Qur'an, that it's not random. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses very specific imagery that hits the hearts of the people listening to it. The first recipients, as well as all the people who will ever read it. So at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. He says, watch out for the day when the sky brings forth clouds of smoke for all to see. Today you feel like you're in difficulty because you are hungry, you don't have enough water, it's hot. Well, imagine that day, the day that you keep denying, the day that you are resisting so hard. Imagine that day where there will be such a great smoke coming from the sky that everyone will be clearly able to see it. Right now it's a smoke that is within you. That will be a smoke that is outside. And it will be even scarier. And so that's part of the, you know, the, the immense miracle of the Qur'an is it's like, you know, be, the ability to be so effective to those people that are listening to it. And so when we now know the context of this ayah, reading it again, O oh, Prophet, and obviously when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's through him, it's through everybody else as well. Watch out for the day when the sky brings forth clouds of smoke for all to see. It adds much more detail to it. But not only that, now I know the specific meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended with this ayah. Right? Without that, that person made up whatever details they wanted to. And they could be like, yeah, it's, that's not saying anything is wrong. And it's not contradicting anything here. It's just extra details. But because we have more details from a, a senior companion that was around at the time of Revelation, we have very particular details about exactly what it means. So that's the first benefit of knowing the occasions of Revelation. The second benefit of learning these occasions of Revelation or learning about them is that they help us understand the wisdom behind certain rulings. Especially in the context of the slow, gradual revelation of the Qur'an. Oftentimes we'll come across concepts or words in the Qur'an and it'll give you like a small, you know, brief description in parentheses or in a footnote or something. And you're like, okay, interesting. Uh, I, I guess I get it. But like, what exactly is this talking about? And so an example of this concept is the concept of dhihar. Dhihar is, I mean, it's a very technical concept that they discuss in books of fiqh and books of law, but understanding what was going on in the society of Arabs at the time of Revelation gives us so much more appreciation for the beauty of the Qur'an and the beauty of the Revelation. So this concept of dhihar was that in pre-Islamic Arabia, oftentimes men that were just trying to be cruel to their wives, they didn't want their wives anymore but they also wanted to make sure they caused them inconvenience. So what they would do is, they would they have this concept called zihar. Zihar comes from the word zahar, which means back. And so what they would say to their wife is, you are like the back of my mother to me. Now obviously, that has its connotation of like, no longer approachable for any type of intimacy. But what was the point of what these people were trying to do? They were trying to cause harm to these women and not release them from the marriage, but also not give them the rights of the marriage that are due to them. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He's revealing the, in the Qur'an, 
when the rulings of Dihar come down, that this is a major sin for anyone to ever engage in anything like this. For us in our religion, marriage is a very, very important institution. And that, just like every other institution, there is a way to enter it and there's a way to exit it. Yes, of course, there are parameters and there are etiquettes and all of these things that are very, very important. But there are ways to enter things and there are ways to exit these arrangements. And all of that functions within a beautiful, harmonious system to ensure that everyone's rights are met and that nobody is oppressed. Nobody is kept in a situation against their will. And that beautiful system was being compromised by this practice of lihar. Now, with this entire context of understanding what lihar is, now if we ever come across this word in the Qur'an or in the translation of the Qur'an, it hits different. It feels different. Because you're thinking about people at that time. You're thinking about people who have been oppressed for years, living in a house, not being given their rights, treating like, being treated like slaves, being treated like subhumans, yet not allowed to move on with their life. And that helps us appreciate the beauty of so many of the rulings in the Qur'an. The third benefit, and this is something that we've been seeing throughout all of the examples so far, is that the context gives deeper color to our understanding of the verses. After understanding some of the benefits of these asbab nuzul these occasions of revelation, there are four main principles related to them. And by understanding these four principles, we can then put them into the wider context. This kind of addresses the original practical question that I had asked in the beginning. And that practical question right at the beginning was, how much do these contexts and occasions of revelation impact the meaning that I get out of this verse? Just because that one verse was revealed at the time when the Quraysh were hungry and famished and they were seeing smoke when they looked up, they're seeing smoky colored, smoky eyed uh, visions. Does it mean that only applies to them? Or does that message still ring true for us? And so these principles will set the boundaries for us uh, very, very clearly. So the first principle is consideration is given to the generality of the wording and not to the specific cause. Yes, there is there are specific causes, and we'll, in the next few principles, it will clarify a little bit more why those causes are important. But in general, whatever the wording of the Qur'an is, whatever benefit we can get out of those word, that wording of the Qur'an while being faithful to the Arabic language that was preserved by the scholars to this day, while being faithful to that meaning, the scope is very, very wide. And this is one of the reasons why the scholars actually say that um, the study of the meanings of the Qur'an is something that every generation can contribute to. And if we go back throughout history and do a survey, uh, every generation, there are scholars that write tafsirs and works of explaining the Qur'an and explaining specific concepts within the Qur'an in a completely different way. Like they have a different framing and different understanding because what these people are doing, what these scholars are doing, is they're taking their lived experience of the world and they're taking that lived experience and their understanding of Arabic and they're merging it together. So it's totally possible for everyone in this room to come up with a new wisdom and benefit from the Qur'an that nobody has ever thought of before. And that's one of the beautiful miracles of the Qur'an. As the scholars of Qur'an, they, they state that each ayah of the Qur'an could contain 60 or 70,000 benefits within it. And they say that each ayah is like an ocean that keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. And many of the scholars, they, have, they, they narrate their experiences and they say that um, if I were to, every time I read the same surah again, every time I read the same passage again, I'm able to derive so many more benefits. And this kind of falls under the larger context and the larger understanding of believers, our belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created this entire cosmos, the one who created my life, the one who created all of the things I engage in in life, my job, my family, my children, uh, my house, all of the things I have access to, all of the things I can interact with. Allah is the one who created all of those things. That same Allah is the one who sent me the Qur'an. 
who sent us all the Qur'an. So obviously what the Qur'an tells us and what the world around us says to us, when it speaks to us and we actually listen to the world, we walk in the world and we see it, we observe it, those two things will align. Those two things will be harmonious. This is why any person who comes to the Qur'an has the potential for deriving a benefit that nobody else has derived before that. And how beautiful would it be that on the Day of Judgment, if we could stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, I, I was able to think of a benefit from your book that nobody else had thought of before me. Even if no one knows about it. On that day, Allah knows about it. Allah knows what I thought about, what I did not think about. That would be such a beautiful moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow all of us to experience that. Amin. So the first principle is that the consideration is given to the generality of the wording and not to the specific cause. In Arabic, this is often repeated a lot of times in, 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 in classes of tafsir. Al-ibra bi'umum al la bi It's a short phrase. Um, you'll probably come across it at some point in your life. So I just thought I'd mention it for this particular principle. It's a very common principle that is cited. The second principle. If the wording indicates only one possible meaning, which is supported by the occasion of revelation, we cannot extend that verse beyond that meaning. Now, if I'm talking about the provisions for Hajj, and let's say provisions can only mean one thing in Arabic. Azad is, you know, the, the food and the other material means that I need to survive. That's how the Arabs understood that word. Now, I can't go and be like, well, actually, Zad kind of sounds like this other word I know. So maybe, what if, there's another meaning here that nobody else figured out before me. Well, that's not obviously what, we're, what we could say, right? And it's like a particular, only one meaning is possible within the Arabic language. That meaning is supported by what was happening at the time of Revelation. Now we cannot extend that verse beyond that meaning. We can apply that meaning elsewhere. But we cannot create new meanings to fit into that verse anymore. An example of this is a companion his name was Ka'b ibn Ujra radiallahu anhu. He's actually uh, not a very well-known companion, but he's actually known because of this incident that happened. So he was in Hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he had really bad lice, and it was so bad that there was like pus, like dripping from his head. It was really, really bad. So you know, initially he had lice. Someone came and informed the Prophet ﷺ that you know, Ka'ab radiallahu anhu has lice in his hair, what should he do? And the Prophet ﷺ told him, like, well, you know, just like, be careful, because obviously when you're in the state of ihram, one of the things that you cannot do is you cannot touch your hair, you cannot, you cannot remove any of your hair, you have to be very careful about grooming as well. So the Prophet ﷺ told him to be patient. Then Ka'ab radiallahu anhu's situation got worse, and so he came himself to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ looked up at him and he saw the pus dripping from his head. And so he told him, oh, I did not know that your situation was this bad. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, فَإِنْ كَانَ بِكُمْ أَذًا أَوْ أَوْ If any of you is ill or has an ailment of the scalp, he should compensate by fasting or feeding the poor or offering a sacrifice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ease and this compensation for this, for this sahabi, for this companion. And he mentioned the wording of if you have an ailment of your scalp, which makes a lot of sense. right? You, know, you can't touch your hair, but if you have a, an illness in your scalp and you would, you would uh, get your cure faster if you were able to shave your head off, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows that. You're not going to be sinful for it. You just have to do compensation because we're here for a particular type of uh, worship and pilgrimage. And to make sure that the reward of it is complete, there's a compensation system for it. But now, this wording here, adham min ra'sihi, there's this ailment in the scalp, in the head. It can only mean one thing in Arabic. And the reason behind Revelation, the story of Ka'b ibn Ujra radiallahu anhu, indicates that same meaning. So now someone can't just come up now and be like, well, actually, I have an itch in my head. And so now I'm going to shave my head. Or, you know, I, uh, my hair is knotted. 
uh, it got like all frizzed up and it got knotted up. And so I, I guess I need to shave my head. Well, no, it's like the story itself tells us there are different extents of it. At one point, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him to be patient. And, and as it got worse, where it became an actual problem and it became an ailment, an illness, that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him the compensation. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed it in the Qur'an and it is preserved for us to this day. So that is the second principle of Asbab al-Nuzul, which is that if the wording only indicates one possible meaning, and that meaning is supported by the occasion of revelation, we cannot extend that verse beyond that meaning and say, well, this thing is also going to be part of the meaning of this verse. The third principle is that the specific meaning in the original context is always going to be the first meaning intended and it's the first meaning for us to fully comprehend before we start exploring other avenues. And this is more of a principle of priorities. And this is one of the things that's very important for us as we study more of the Qur'an and as we reflect more on the verses of the Qur'an. You know, oftentimes our first instinct is um, to connect it to something within our lives. You know, we see an incident happening or we see a passage in the Qur'an and we're like, oh, that kind of reminds me of a particular incident in my life, which is good. It's a very, very important step and it's a part of our reflection on the Qur'an. However, our first step should be, do I actually understand this correctly or do I actually understand what this, is, this passage is telling me? Or am I just plucking like one half of an ayah out of context, taking it and just like applying it all across my life, all right? One example of this, uh, it will come up in, 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 in a few bullet points as well, is that after the Prophet Sallallahu passing, when the companions, there were some of the companions that were still alive at this time, and they were going towards Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, in Turkey. And that was the first siege of Istanbul, of, of Constantinople. And the Muslims were very motivated by you know, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that mentions that the army that is able to take Constantinople is going to be the best of armies and the, the, the person leading that army is going to be the best of people, best of leaders. So people were motivated, the Sahaba were motivated from a very, very early time to try that. In this um, battle for Constantinople, there was this very difficult standoff. And in the standoff, the Roman army from Constantinople, they had like rows of soldiers. So what one of the Muslim soldiers decided to do, he was like, okay, you know what, guys? Throw me into the mix. Like, throw me over them. And I'll, I'll just fight and I'll take out as many as I can. And so they, his friends throw him over. And he starts fighting, fighting, fighting. And he eventually makes it back. So people started describing what he did in a particular way. They said, oh, he threw himself into destruction. And they were quoting an ayah of the Qur'an. وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, and do not throw yourselves into destruction. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us not, to not do that, to not be reckless, right? Now, they were taking that specific ayah out of its context and applying it to a very different place. And they were saying, oh, this person is throwing himself into destruction, which literally speaking is true. Yes, of course, like he's a one against 50 odds. It's pretty tough, pretty uh, hard odds. So in that literal sense, that was correct. But in that army was a senior companion. At this point, he was really old. And his name was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, which is why today you find his grave in Istanbul. He was part of that army that was fighting at that time, and he was very uh, elderly. And he asked, as he was on his deathbed, he asked the people, um, if you could bury me near or under the walls of Constantinople, maybe on the Day of Judgment, I will tell Allah that I tried my best to be among that army that is the best of armies. And so Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was in this army at this time. And he overheard these younger soldiers, younger Muslims, talking about this, having their back and forth. And so he told them, you all are making fools of yourself. That's not what this ayah is about. This ayah was actually revealed in the opposite context. He said, we, from the Ansar in Medina, 
after some time of like you know military battles and campaigns again and again and again, and we are funding all of these uh, ghazawat and these battles with the Prophet wasallam, some of us felt like, oh, our financial reservoirs are going down. Our savings accounts are like decreasing. So some of the Ansar, he said, we gathered together and we were like, yeah, maybe we should hold back a little bit and not be as generous anymore. Just because, you know, we have to take care of our families, we have to take care of our children, all this kind of stuff. We have to leave behind some safety net for them. And at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that ayah. And do not throw yourselves into destruction. Essentially warning them from stopping their spending from stopping their generosity because that is the true destruction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to worry about, wants us all to worry about as well. And so in a way they kind of flipped the whole thing and this person who was going straight into battle to fight and to help the Muslims was being told that he was throwing himself into destruction. Whereas in the original context it was people who were holding back from it that were told don't throw yourselves into destruction. And so this is one of the places where it's very, very important to first understand what was the primary meaning. When the Qur'an was being revealed to the Prophet wasallam. at that point, what was the message that was coming from this ayah of the Qur'an? And that's a very, very important step. And the last principle is that if there are, no, if there are other non-conflicting meanings possible, they can also be understood from the verse as well. And so that's the, the ayah that I mentioned previously. Do not throw yourselves into destruction with your own hands. لا تلقوا بأيديكم إلى التهلكة. The original context was to encourage Muslims to spend for the sake of Allah. Destruction was what they would do by not spending their money. Now, other meanings that are possible is if I live a life full of sins, major sins all the time, evil acts, harming people, oppressing people left and right, Am I throwing myself into, myself into destruction? Definitely I'm throwing myself into destruction. I'm doing it with my own hands. I had the full free will and I chose to use that free will in the wrong way. I chose to make the wrong decisions. And not just like, you know, I make a mistake here and there. Like, you know, again and again and again and again and again, especially when it involves the rights of other people. That's definitely part of this ayah as well. But we have to start in the first, in the right priority. Understanding the ayah on its own merits, on its own grounds, when it was revealed, and then where can, how much can we extend it according to the language of the Quran. So these are the four principles, and if we understand these four principles, that is all there is to understand about Asbab and Nuzul, the occasions of revelation. Are there any quick questions about this? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, can you wait for the mic, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. I have a quick question. Sometimes there is a disagreement between the context. Uh, like the one where I'm personally struggling right now is Surat at takhasur So the graveyard. Some people say that there were people who would go to graveyard and count the dead people. And some mm -hmm. people say, no, that context wasn't there. So how do you understand, like, how do you yeah. decompose that part? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So now that's sort of the next level of Asbab and Nuzul discussions that uh, we won't go into today, but those are all you know, uh, pr uh, preserved by the scholars themselves. And the idea there is that a couple of different points I'll mention. One is sometimes it is possible that there are multiple uh, contexts of revelation. How? Sometimes there are surahs that very likely could have been revealed twice. Was there a necessary reason for it to reveal twice? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but sometimes it is for uh, granting that surah an extra honor. So for example, one of the famous ones that's mentioned is Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, so Surah Al-Fatiha, some scholars say is Makki, some scholars say that it is Madani, and some scholars say that it's both actually. It was revealed twice. That's one possibility. Second possibility is sometimes when early scholars are talking about the context or where this ayah applies, they're actually not talking about an occasion of revelation or like you know the event or thing that happened that caused this ayah to be revealed. What they're saying is that this ayah applies here as well. This was this other situation that was happening, or it came up later, and that ayah applied directly to those people. So those are two different things that are kind of mentioned with similar language by early scholars. Um, so they'll say something like, Nazalat fi kada. This was revealed 
about this or unzilat fi kada. This was revealed about, about this particular topic. So these are some of the wordings that are used by the early scholars. And so uh, these are a couple of the ways that the scholars will use to uh, navigate where there's multiple uh, conflicting con uh, contexts for a particular ayah or for a particular passage. Um, the other thing I will mention as well is before we get into all of this, one of the basic things that the scholars always do is they will make sure that all of the Okay, the contexts that are mentioned are authentically transmitted to us. Because sometimes it is also possible that some of them are weakly transmitted to us, and so they're not going to be preferred over the other one. Then. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we move on. So just a quick summary of occasions of revelation. Asbab al the occasion of revelation gives us added depth of understanding, but any additional meanings contained by the wording of the Qur'an can still be understood from it, as long as it is not in conflict with the main meaning. And this kind of summarizes our entire discussion in one quick sentence. Alright, so that brings us to the second discussion that we have here for today. And this second discussion is related to the organization of the Qur'an. The organization of the Qur'an is something that we often assume and we never really pay attention to. Um, it's something that, you know, when, as, where every time we read the Qur'an, it's right there, it's staring us in the face, but we kind of just ignore it. It's kind of like when you walk into a room and you kind of don't really think about the walls around you or the floor or the ceiling. It's just there. You kind of ignore those things. And so the organization of the Qur'an is a similar aspect of the Qur'an. So there are different ways that the Qur'an is organized. And so we'll go through two different types of organization systems here. The first is that the Qur'an is split into 114 surahs. And those surahs are then split up into ayahs. All right, so that's one system of organization, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about that system in a, in a few moments. The second way of organizing the Qur'an is actually, there's two versions of it. Um, Let's we'll start with the first one. So the Qur'an is split up into 30 parts, 30 juz, some people call it uh, paras, so 30 paras, 30 juz. And now those juz will then be separated into smaller pieces. So one system of it is that it's 20 rukus in a, in a, in a para. Uh, and then the other system is that one juz is split into two hizbs, and each hizb is split into four rubas, essentially giving you eight parts within every single juz. So the first system gives you 20 parts, and the second one gives you eight. So this second system is a human endeavor by the scholars of the generations that came later after the Prophet ﷺ. And the point of it was to make reading the Qur'an and memorizing the Qur'an easy. In the early generations, and especially at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the, the two generations after, three generations after him, people would finish reading the Qur'an every seven days or every three days. And when they would read it every seven days, they had a particular amount that they would read day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. They'll stop at the end of this surah and that surah and that surah. Well now, as people obviously you know, became weaker in, in their memorization and their ability to read and kind of got lazier over generations, it became harder for people to do that. But still people were trying to finish the Qur'an or read through the Qur'an every month. Or they were trying to uh, review their Qur'an every month. Or even if they weren't able to do it for the rest of the year, at least in Ramadan, they would do it for 30 days. They would try to finish one whole Qur'an. And so the scholars then they sat down and they decided, okay, we're going to divide the Qur'an into 30 parts that will be roughly equal so that people don't you know, get overburdened on some days and have like very little to read on other days. It's kind of like roughly equal. So they did that. And then within those juz, each of those one thirtieths of the Qur'an, they decided to split further. So if somebody is praying 20 rakat of taraweeh, they would need 20 parts. So they don't have to think about, okay, where do I stop? Where do I not stop? I mean, sometimes if you kind of mess up and you miss those, part, uh, you, those spots and you end up with like really small rakats and then really long rakats right next to it, and it's like, oh, I guess uh, it was not really timed well today, right? Um, and so the, the, rukus, the 20 rukus are meant to help with that aspect of it. The other version of it, which splits the juz into eight parts, is more designed for tahajjud. 
as we have narrations from the Prophet وسلم, that he would pray eight rakahs of tahajjud every night uh, throughout the year. Um, and so the, the scholars decided that we should split this juz up into eight so that somebody who's praying eight rakahs of tahajjud is able to read a whole juz in that tahajjud every night. So whoever wants to do that throughout the year, they can do that and they can finish a whole Qur'an. But the key aspect of this second way of organizing the Qur'an is that this is a human endeavor done by scholars throughout generations. Obviously it's been reviewed and refined, etc., etc. But sometimes you will come across situations where a juz ends and the story is halfway. Or it's like the middle of someone talking. And so... Sometimes you have to be a little bit flexible and like move a few ayahs back and forth just to make sure that the general meaning is completed. Um, one of the funny incidents that uh, I heard once was there was an imam, was a young imam, was very, very young, and he was leading and he was reading Surah Yusuf. And so as you know, uh, in the story of, of Yusuf alayhi salam, uh, you know, he gets taken away from his family by his older brothers and they throw him into a well and then he's there for some time and while he's there, and when he's there, like the, this caravan is passing by, and they pick him up and take him. So this young brother was leading the prayer, and he starts from the beginning of Surah Yusuf. He reads a few pages, and then he stops and goes into ruku. Well, he reads one page or one page and a half, and he goes into ruku. He gets up, and then he reads like another page or page and a half, and then he goes into ruku again. And this is like Aisha prayer or something, and then he finishes. So this uh, this is funny scholar, you know, he likes to joke around and like make light, light of situations, he walks up to him and he says, uh, I really like your recitation, mashallah, it was very beautiful, very beautiful to listen to. I just have one question, um, why did you leave Yusuf Ali Salam in the well? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a light moment, but like, you know, it's, a, it's also a teaching moment for them, for, for this young brother as well. The, the idea that, you know, it's nice to have completion and have closure in whatever you're listening to, whatever you're reading, and try to go with that. Uh, so obviously for us it's a little bit harder when we don't have direct access to the Arabic language, but it's nice to also you know, keep your translation along as you're reading through and just see, okay, well, what is the meaning going on here? Where should I stop? Where's a good place to stop? Where's an appropriate place to, place to stop? And, some, and most of the time that is determined by meaning. Generally speaking, if you follow the juz, you follow the ruku, follow the juz and the hizb and the ruba, you'll be like basically on the mark for like 98% of the Qur'an. There'll be a couple of places. There'll be a little bit here and there, but alhamdulillah. Uh, everything that is not the Qur'an, everything that is not the speech of Allah has imperfections. Every effort that is not from Allah and from the Prophet Sallallahu has imperfections. All of us um, are human beings. So that's part of the process and the part of the learning of the Qur'an. Now we return back to the first type of organization and we're going to spend some time going through each bit and piece of it after this slide as well. The Qur'an is split into 114 surahs and those 114 surahs are all divided into ayahs. I've put a translation of verses next to it and we'll talk about verses for the next couple of slides and why that's a translation I, I, I like personally. Some, some people don't like it, but that's okay. That's their preference. Um, the basic unit in the Qur'an is an ayah. Now an interesting thing is, when you look at the translation of the Qur'an, sometimes an ayah is like an incomplete sentence, it's like half a sentence. Sometimes it's just like one word or two words, and they're like nouns, and you're like, well, how does that, how is that like a separate thing, right? And so the first principle that kind of sets the table for this discussion that's going to go on for the next couple of slides is that this organizational system of the Qur'an being broken down into surahs and surahs being broken down into ayahs comes from the Prophet ﷺ. There's no simple rule to understand the relationship between that and the meaning or between that and where do we find the ayahs, where does the ayah end, there's no like simple rule for it. For the juz and for all the other stuff, there are rules that people try to come up with, but there's no simple rule here at all. Um, and these are the things that the scholars describe as tawqifi. Tawqifi comes from the word waqf. Waqf means to stop. And why do they use this word tawqif? Tawqif means something that scholars and all of the you know, lay people like us, we won't be able to understand the logic of it. And something where we stop before it, because it comes from the Prophet ﷺ, and which is part of the divine revelation. 
We can try to understand wisdoms from it. We can try to understand benefits from it. But if we don't fully comprehend it, that's okay. We're human beings. We have limited intellects. Our brains function within you know, a linear time and space. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of time and space. He's not controlled, he's not limited by it in any way, uh, any way, shape, or form. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who revealed the Quran to us in a particular form for us to benefit from it. And so that's the main system of the Quran that we have from the time of the Prophet wasallam to this day. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail now. So, this question of our ayahs and verses simply sentences? And then there's another question here of, is verse a good translation? So what is a sentence? I, uh, I teach Arabic, so I apologize if this is getting a little too, air, too like, you know, grammatical. A sentence is a complete thought. Like if I say something like, Ahmed ate a banana, or Sarah ran, or Sarah ran a marathon, that's a complete sentence, a complete thought. At the end of this complete thought, I can stop, and you got something useful from me. But sometimes when we look at an ayah, you don't get a complete thought from one ayah only. The sentence kind of spills over into two, three, four, sometimes verses all together. So what's going on here? It seems a little strange, right? One way to approach this is to say, well, Allah knows best and I don't know. But alhamdulillah, the scholars have put their minds to it, like hundreds of minds to it for generations. So we have some more uh, aspects of wisdom that we can maybe chew on a little bit and maybe reflect on as we read through the Qur'an, and maybe it will help us in our reflection as well. So one idea, one concept that Arabs had, and we have in our literature, in our culture as well, is the idea of poetry and prose. These are two primary forms of literature that we have. Poetry is going to have a very particular form, very tight, very neat, strict rules, of what words can come, what words cannot come, how the syllables are going to be, all the kind of stuff, the rhyming scheme, all this kind of stuff. Prose is not going to have any of those strict rules in it. Both of them are present in every culture. Both of them have their particular roles to fulfill. And this kind of illustrates to us the world in which the Quran was revealed. There was poetry. The Arabs were very proud of their poetry. And they would have these like famous... Uh, poetry competitions every year in which the best poets from all across Arabia would come there, present their best works, and they would have all kinds of genres of poetry. They would have uh, you know, poetry that is praising kings and trying to get money from them, basically. It's, you know, uh, like, you know, they, they needed their yes men and like, you know, the people to hype them up, hype men. So you had that kind of poetry. You also had like diss poetry, like they're dissing each other. And like, you know, one poet's like, oh, you suck so much. And the other one's like, you suck so much. So, you know, it's like, we have the same type of culture to this day. Yes, the shape of it, the form of it may have varied a little bit, but in spoken word, for example, it's poetry being performed in front of a crowd in a particular way. And that was the same type of culture that they had back then. And in fact, at that time as well, they would sing poetry. And the poets would practice how to deliver this poem in front of a large crowd. So, poetry a big part of Arabic Arab culture. Prose was also part of their culture. And prose is part of every everyday life, right? You know, whenever you want to communicate information to someone, you want to send a text, you want to send an email, you want to send a, write an article, whatever it might be. You want to put a poster up, it's all prose. There's no need to like put it into like nice syllable structures and like, oh, I need all this, uh, you know, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. I need to have an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. All this kind of fancy stuff you learn in like literature class. We don't need it for like everyday life. But we all recognize that poetry is very effective. You hear a powerful poem, you hear one of, those, uh, one of these people that do spoken word, the message gets delivered in a very different way. Now, the Quran is coming to a similar world where there's two forms of literature, two forms of communication. And the Quran does something very unique. It doesn't choose either one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a new genre. A new way of communication that has the benefits of both. It has clear communication. It has information being conveyed in a simple, straightforward way. But at the same time, there's beauty in it. There's rhymes. There's 
short sentences in some surahs. There's longer sentences, longer ayat in certain surahs. So you read a short surah, or even if you hear it in tarawih, you're listening to a surah, for example, in Juz Am, like the last Juz of the Quran, many of the surahs have very, very short, short ayat. And you hear a powerful reciter reciting them, it feels like a heartbeat. It's like boom, 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 boom. And it has a different type of impact on our heart. Then you listen to Surah Al-Baqarah and has long verses. Surah Al Imran, Surah Al Nisa have really, really long verses. And you're hearing it, and there's a different type of effect. Like your mind is going on a journey. Your heart is going on a journey with the whole verse. And you're trying to understand what is going on here. There's so much to unpack for me. Both of them have their places, and there's obviously a mix of those as well in, in different surahs. But this is just like a high level of sort of the spirit here. When, we, when you come to the Qur'an, it's the highest form of literature. The best poets, the best prose writers of the time, they heard it, and they knew this was not something that a human being came up with. Because this was not something that human beings wrote. Human beings wrote poetry or they wrote prose. They didn't mix stuff up like this in a very, very effective way. And that extreme effectiveness is humanly impossible. Where every single word has been chosen perfectly, captures every single nuanced meaning possible. Which is why to this day, 1450 years later, we continue to extract more and more and more benefits that apply to our world today. If we think about some of the verses of the Qur'an, that talk about the universe and the creation of the universe. There's particular wording that is used that is very simple for, an, for an, a random Arab person living in the desert 1450 years ago to understand. They got a basic meaning out of it. But to this day, we are uncovering more and more and more about how scientifically exact those descriptions were. Of course, it's not a book of science. The Qur'an is not here to teach us about our science. Science is something we learn using other methods and other means. But, going back to the first the thing I mentioned earlier, Allah is the same Allah who created this whole world. And that same Allah is the one who sent us the Qur'an. So there will never ever be any conflict between those two things. And the more we explore the Qur'an, and the more we explore the world, the more we will realize the complete harmony between those two things. So this is part of the eloquent, the, the miraculous eloquence of the Qur'an. So when we go to poetry, a verse of poetry is also not always a full sentence. Which is one of the reasons why verse is a good translation, in my opinion, and some of my teachers take this opinion as well. Verse is a good translation for ayah as opposed to other things. Uh, one, one option is obviously just to say ayah. The other is you say verse and it's like an English word, so it's a little bit easier for people to swallow. So let's look at an example of um, poetry versus prose. And these are English poetry and English prose, right? And this is going to put together everything that we have talked about. And I'm taking this from well-known English literature. Shakespeare in a sonnet says, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. This is part of one of his sonnets. And you can see that the sentence, there's one sentence that is four lines long. In the middle of the sentence, there's a semicolon. And the sentence kind of just like flows through. But there's a reason why the line ends where it does. I'm not a good poetry reader, but there are very, very good poetry readers and spoken word artists who will read this same sonnet to you and their pause right there at the end of the line every single time, it leaves you with a certain suspense, a certain feeling in your heart trying to get to the next part, creating that anticipation, creating that effect. And that's one of the powerful things about poetry. Now we go to an example of prose. This is from Oscar Wilde's 1984. Um, I don't know why I chose this novel. I, I thought it was a great novel when I read it like several years ago. This is the first paragraph of that article, uh, sorry, that, that novel. It starts off with, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking, th striking 13. Winston Smith his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. You can see something of a flow there. 
already within two sentences, one sentence was short and it gave you something really quickly. Then the next sentence took you on this ride. It gave you description, description, description. And so I was able to get this information that I needed from the author in an effective way. But there's something else that can be added from the poetry. Poetry had its own benefit and prose had its own benefit. So, before we go back to the Qur'an, a question. Where do speeches fall in the spectrum between poetry and prose? If you have heard powerful speak speeches from the past, for example, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches or um, the Gettysburg Address or other you know, famous speeches that have happened uh, in English, you'll realize that there's something of a mix going on there between poetry and prose, where it goes like prose most of the time, where there's sentences that are being used, but sometimes you'll have rhythm. Sometimes you'll have repetition. Sometimes you'll have random places where the person stops for effect. And you'll see this reflected also in our masjid when a powerful khatib comes. There are some khatibs when they step up on the podium, on the mimbar, they start delivering and your heart is just like, like you're just stuck there. Like mesmerized by every single word coming out of the speaker's mouth, this khatib's mouth. That's what effective khatibs do as well. Is they'll present the same idea, but they'll present it in a very exact form. They'll use their intonation, they'll use their pauses, they'll use their speed of speech to effectively hit your heart. And I, use, I say the exact same content. I'm saying it in a monotonous way. Saying it full sentences, stopping only at commas and periods. That's it. Or, you know, semicolons, I guess. Stopping at those exact places. People will zone in and out and in and out. It will be that kind of khutbah where, like, it's kind of like, you know, you, you're flying on a plane and the moment you wake up is when the, the wheels land. So it's like you're, you're, you're sitting in a khutbah and like you're kind of like your brain slowly just like fogs away into the clouds. And the moment you land is when the khatib at the end of it is like, Allahumma ghfir al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's over. <laughs> so, and it happens, right? I mean, obviously, we, uh, we as people listening, we have to try our best. And that's our etiquette, is to be as focused as we can. But there's something natural that we observe is that there are some people, who, some speakers who are able to capture that attention much better than other speakers. And the thing that they are good at is mixing these elements up in the right way. And the peak of that is what the Qur'an gives us. So this is uh, from the Gettysburg Address. As you can see, this is one sentence. I've kind of broken it up into four lines. So four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You can see already, even though I'm not a great speaker, but you can see the effect of those pauses. Some are shorter phrases, some are longer phrases. It's starting to get you in that interesting territory between poetry and prose. Here, obviously, there's not that much uh, rhyming, but some effective speakers will also include, include rhyming and rhythm into their uh, speeches. So one way to conceive of surahs, one way to like sort of picture surahs in our minds is like a speech or a royal edict by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. If we look at any surah, if we look at the longest surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and we look at the shortest surah, Surah Al-Kawthar, three verses, 287 verses. One is like two and a half barely lines long, and one is almost 48 pages long. There is a consistent message that is being taught to humanity in each surah of the Qur'an. And this is one of the things that scholars explore. Some of the more detailed, work, detailed works of tafsir, the scholars will start off with, what are the themes of the surah? And they'll explore two or three main themes of the surah. And then as they go through the surah itself, they will tie every concept to those themes. They'll show you how it's all connected. And one of the ways that uh, one of the scholars of the last, last century, he described it as like threads that, go, that flow through that surah. Sometimes it might seem like it's going off topic. We're going into this random tangent over here, random story over there. 
but it's all connected. Now bring it back to the context of the speech. What do effective speakers do? Effective khatibs do? They'll tell you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. They'll tell you facts about it, but in the middle, they'll stop. And they'll tell you a story from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They'll tell you a story from the companions. They'll tell you a story about someone righteous from the past. It seems like it's random. If you happen to walk into the khutbah at that time, you're like, oh, that's an interesting story that's happening right now. I wonder how it's related to the rest of the khutbah. But then, if you had heard it from the beginning to the end, you would see that there's a thread flowing through all of it. And if someone were to chat GPT, summarize it all into like five lines, you could. It would be like five simple lines. Like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. He's merciful to all of his servants and we all need his mercy. Something simple like that, right? But me saying those three sentences to you today is not the same as when the khatib gives you a 20-minute khutbah that hits your heart and you feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. And then you go and read the Quran and you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And your heart just like stops. And you can't even read more. Because all those meanings just like flood your senses. Your consciousness just gets filled with all of the thoughts that the khatib had mentioned. And you just like can't hold it anymore. That type of experience happens when you have an effective communication of knowledge. One of the interesting one of the interesting lessons in, uh, in teaching that I received from one of my teachers is he said that there's a very big difference between a fact, a piece of knowledge, one sentence, and between us living that fact, that fact becoming a part of who I am. Because those words, even though, you know, written on a sentence, written on a piece of paper, it seems like one sentence, simple sentence, simple idea, I understand it. But when I start living those words, we feel those words like flowing through our veins. And that's the best way to describe it. And one example, quickly, of that is, Alhamdulillah, all of us say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We believe the Prophet Wasallam is our messenger. But then you start reading the life of the Prophet Not just the life events like the battles and the this and that, you know, the major events. No, no, no. Start looking at the small moments in the life of the Prophet How this young boy who had a pet bird and his pet bird died. Now imagine, you know, young children with a little pet. The pet dies, you feel sad, and you know, they'll be a little bit out of it for some days. The Prophet said and found out about this, so he went to this young child. He sat down with the young child, like a four or five year old. He says, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughair? He says, Oh, Aba Umair, what happened to your bird? He sat with him, consoled him, he laughed with him a little, he, he used rhyming words, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughair? You know, like, you know how children like rhyming couplets and little nursery rhyme type things. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose the right words for that particular context. And you read that and you feel Muhammadun Rasulullah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he really is my messenger. He is my prophet, the one that I believe in. The one that I love. You read about the lady that came to the Prophet وسلم, looking distressed. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, can I talk to you privately? So she took him away from the crowd, away from the masjid. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have one request. Please make dua for my recovery. She said, I have seizures and they're really, really, really bad. So much so that sometimes my aura becomes uncovered. The Prophet وسلم, said, if you wish to be patient, then Allah will reward you endlessly in the next life. And this lady said, she thought about it for a moment. And then she said, Ya Rasulullah, I'll be patient, but can you please make dua that my aura doesn't come uncovered? And the Prophet ﷺ said, I will make that dua for you right now. You see something very beautiful there about the Prophet ﷺ. He left the crowd, he left the masses, because one sister in the community had something that she wanted to ask. She didn't feel comfortable asking it in the, in the crowd, so she took him to the side. He went with her to the side. He didn't say, no, I'm too important, I'm too busy. He took time out for everybody. You read these little incidents scattered throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ, 
and you feel Muhammadun Rasulullah. And then you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, and your heart fills with love. And when people talk about living through the love of the Prophet, وسلم, this is how that love grows. When you learn more. And the same thing applies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why the scholars always recommend that we learn about the 99 names of Allah. What are the different ways that Allah's attributes manifest in my life? Through His love, through His gentleness, through His subtleness, through His creativity, all of the different attributes of Allah. As I learn more and more and more about them, I'll start to see them in front of me. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, in a very academic work, a very advanced work, he starts off in his introduction and he says the entire point of learning about our beliefs is so that when I step out of my house, I'm not like everybody else. Other people, they walk out and they see a street. They see a car, they see a tree, they see a cloud, they see a person. He said what we want to be is when we walk out of our house, we see the creation of Allah. We see the mercy of Allah. We see the gifts of Allah. We see the creativity of Allah. Everything is connecting us to Allah. It's all uncovering in front of our eyes. He said, that's the point of studying who Allah is. And he's mentioning this, it's kind of like shocking, like, you know, a lot of more, more advanced technical books, they'll go through a lot of very technical details and this and that. They won't have a lot of these, like, you know, spiritual motivators, but Imam Ghazali is like, no, we all need to start with this spiritual motivation first. If we're doing it for any other purpose, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. All of this to say, coming back to our room, we've actually kind of gone on a tangent. I don't know if this was a good tangent or not. Um, you all can be the determiners of that. The idea of the Qur'an, when you read one surah from beginning to end, whether it's a long surah like Surah Al-Baqarah, or whether it's a short surah like Surah Al-Kawthar, what is happening is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to communicate a strong message, an important message to us. All the twists and turns, the whole journey, the path that we take, that is part of the message that we need. One of the biggest problems, one of the cons, I guess I would say, I wouldn't say biggest problems, it's like a little bit overstating it. Uh, apologize for being too dramatic. Um, one of the cons of living in the age of print and a lot of publishing, if you go 200 years back, it wasn't very cheap to you know, buy books and publish books and there wasn't massive printers everywhere. There was no like internet typing or any of that stuff. We have this stuff so commonly available now that the primary way, the main way that we interact with the Qur'an is by looking at it. But if you go a hundred years back, the primary way people were interacting with the Qur'an was listening to it. Now I ask you all a question. Is a speech more effective when it's heard? or when it's, when it's read from a piece of paper. When it's, when it's heard, exactly. You can have the most powerful khatib come here, give a khutbah. That's different from if you got the transcript later and you just read it. I, I didn't go to the Jummah here that day, I went to some other masjid. I'm like, oh, I heard it was a really powerful khutbah. Do you have a recording? Like, oh, the camera failed actually. But we have a transcript. And so I'm like, oh, cool, perfect, I'll read through it. Sure, it will have some of that effect there. Something will be there. The message will still be there. And I'll get a lot of benefit out of it. But it's not the same thing. Now imagine the Sahaba 1450 years ago. Where are they consuming the Quran? How are they listening to it? How are they getting it? They were standing in prayer behind the Prophet ﷺ. And he's reciting. And they're just there. Receiving the words from their Lord. Getting those messages. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ prayed so long. is because when he recited, he was feeling the meanings coming to him again. Which is why the companions and the scholars and the righteous people of every generation, there is this beauty that they find in reciting the Qur'an out loud, where they can hear it. And there's something special about that that we cannot ignore. So, the surahs are like royal edicts, speeches from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. They're similar to prose in the fact that they convey information clearly and persuasively. There's a focus on clarity. There's nothing in the Qur'an that is not clear. If there's something that, Allah, that is left ambiguous, that is also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see this in effective speakers too. Sometimes they'll use double meaning for an effect. 
it's not just like a straight thing that you know i happened to drop a bar and i didn't even like you know like a drop of like like a bar of like poetry and like i'm just like oh i'm a poet i didn't even know it type of thing like you know some people i guess are like that they're just like so good at this stuff but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single word every single ayah in the quran is intentional there's a concept of intentional ambiguity and that's part of effective communication and one of the very uh, interesting things is when you look at all the translations of the Quran into English, some of the most powerful ones are the ones that are written by, by, by people who were writers in English before. So you have the example of Marmaduke Pictal. I mean, his English is a little bit dated, but when you read the English of Marmaduke Pictal, and you, for example, compare it to um, the clear Quran, the Glue Quran is a great translation. I, I, I use that translation as my first translation most of the time. But just comparing the two of them, you notice something. The Clear Quran is very good at giving you the meaning in a very simple and straightforward way. It translates, translates it all into prose. Simple prose. What uh, Marmaduke Pictal, rahimahullah ta'ala, what he does is he gives it to you in very effective language. Because he's a writer. He used to write essays, he used to write novels before he became Muslim as well. Then he became Muslim, he learned Arabic. And then he was able to understand the meanings and express them in English in a very powerful way. A very good modern example of that type of translation is the translation, um, what's the name of it? The one by Sheikh Nuh Keller. What's the name of it? Does anyone remember the name of it? No. Okay, so it was recently, recently published. And what Sheikh Nuh Keller does, yes, the Quran beheld. It's a very powerful translation. And what Sheikh Nuh did is he sat with one of the most senior scholars of tafsir in the world, Sheikh Ali Hani. And he sat with him ayah by ayah by ayah of the whole Quran, made sure he understood the, the ayah correctly and fully. Then, using his native English speaking skills, his writing skills, his effective communication skills, he tried to express it while capturing the, the, the rhetorical features that are present in the Arabic itself. So when you pick it up, I have to look at the dictionary. I have to look at the English dictionary to understand the translation. But that's part of the journey, right? But Because when you then understand a new level of vocabulary in English, you understand that these two words have a slightly different meaning. You understand that extra nuance that was present in the Arabic. And so... Uh, this is something that we can also experience in the translations of the Quran. So with just simple prose, you have clear information that is being conveyed. It, of course, is being conveyed in a persuasive way, but the focus is on clarity. Poetry, and, and when I say poetry, you don't think of like, you know, poetry that we read in literature class, but think of spoken word. I think that's a very much more accurate representation of what we mean by poetry because it's actually performed. It incorporates figurative language. It incorporates rhetorical devices. It has rhythm in it. And the most effective you know, spoken word artists are very good at that. Like they'll stop in the middle of the sentence and you know the next word without even knowing the next word. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes there's a word they don't want to say. They won't even say it. But you know exactly what they're intending to say there. And that's something you'll see in the Quran as well. And then sometimes you, like, you know, as a beginner student of the Quran, I just go to it and I'm like, huh, why are the scholars of tafsir saying that there is a omitted word here? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. An example of this today, actually, I was uh, in the, in the Jum'ah Khutbah. When Yaqub alayhi salam, the father of Yusuf alayhi salam, is going through immense sorrow, this happens twice in the surah. The first time is when his young son, seven or eight years old, is taken away from him. When his other sons come back with this, uh, you know, this shirt with fake blood on it, and they say, oh, you know, he got eaten by a wolf. Yaqub has this deep internal struggle. There's the emotional, human, psychological side of him that is feeling this really, really deep sadness. Because this is his son, young son. This got taken away from him. And he's elderly and he can't go and find him. Obviously these young sons took him far enough away that their father wouldn't be able to find him. So he has no hope of finding his son at this point. Obviously he's a prophet of Allah, so he 
uh, he's receiving revelation from Allah as well. But there's this very deep sorrow. At the same time, the spiritual side of him that's pulling him up, his soul, it's telling him he has to be patient because Allah is the one in control. He has to be patient with the decree of Allah. How does this come out in the Quran? The words are, Al Sabrun Jamil. Literally, then beautiful patience. That's not even a sentence. It's almost like in that moment, Yaqub salam, he needed something to hold on to. And so he just had to tell himself beautiful patience. And in his mind, it's like this is this is what we have to get to, this is what we have to do, but I just it's hard. He just had to say it. And when he said it out loud, he had something to hold on to. Beautiful patience. And then it happens again when he loses two other sons. One that gets captured for stealing, which is a setup. And then the other son who says, I can't face my father with like this anymore. I've lost two of his, two of his sons. He loses two more sons. They go back to Yaqub alayhi salam. He says again, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Beautiful patience. Then he turns away and he goes into private into his room and he turns to Allah. And he says, Ya Asafa ala Yusuf. How much sadness and heaviness I have because of Yusuf. And this is decades later, like 30 or 40 years after the first one. It's the same expression again. It's not even a full sentence. But when we read it, in this way, we understand exactly what he means because many of us have gone through that same type of experience where we have gone through some type of deep sorrow and grief in our lives where we couldn't even find words. People ask, how are you doing? You don't even have the words to say anything. But that's what makes effective communication in the Qur'an, the miraculous eloquence of the Qur'an. And sometimes the Qur'an communicates more by what it doesn't say in that sentence than what it does say. As exemplified by Yaqub in that sentence. So, coming back to the slide, in poetry, you'll have these types of devices being used for effect so that the focus there is now on impact and evoking emotion. Getting people to act. The mission, uh, sorry, the message is the same. The message is the same throughout the Quran. You, know, you have this, we have several stories coming several times in the Quran. Sorry, Musa Islam repeats many times in the Quran. The basic message of Islam is the five pillars, the six pillars of faith, the five pillars of, of action. That's the basic message of Islam. It's very, very simple. You can explain who, what Islam is to someone in five minutes. But what is the Quran doing in 600 pages? It's communicating it in such a way to us so that we are moved to act according to it. Yes, we all believe in the day of judgment, but do we act as if we believe in the Day of Judgment. Is that something that we see in front of our eye? When we read the descriptions of hellfire, we read the descriptions of the beauty of Jannah, do we imagine it in front of our eyes? Because if we imagined it in front of our eyes, then we would be moved to act according to it. And that's what the Qur'an does so effectively. And this is why the Qur'an is a mix of poetry and prose. Brother Munir, how long is there until Maghrib? Two minutes? So, okay. Um, all right. So we'll stop at this one more, one last point, which is that if you want to summarize this in one sentence, the Quran's unique style, unique style for its time, in the sense of, okay, it wasn't poetry or prose, it was something different, it was something in between, packed the perfect balance between form and function. Packed the perfect balance between substance and style. When it comes to the Quran, the substance is always there. You know, the message of the Quran is the highest priority. But the beauty of how it's presented is never compromised. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to appreciate some of the beauty of the Qur'an. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the Qur'an's words and its meanings to flow through our blood and through our veins, the way that our blood flows. But so much so that when we walk through this world and walk through our lives, we experience the Qur'an in every single moment of our lives. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah we'll continue after the Maghrib prayer. We have a little bit more left and then we'll have some questions and answers. So... Before we went to Maghrib, we've been talking about you know, the effective style of the Qur'an and how it's somewhere in between prose and poetry. So let's look at an example from the Qur'an itself, from Surah Al-Ghafir. Um, 
So here's, I'm just going to put the translation and I've kind of put it into bullet points just to make it obvious which uh, where each ayah ends. Sometimes the way ayahs are organized in the translation, it, like, it makes it look like it's a full sentence. But if you look at them ayah by ayah, this is one of the things that uh, the Quran beheld by Sheikh Nuh Keller. It actually does this very effectively. Is like He does it line by line in this way. Uh, not like bullet points, but it's like line by line. So let's read through this and see where the um, sentence starts and ends. So those who reject the scripture and the messages we have sent through our messengers. That also does not seem like it's a full sentence, by the way. But let's just go on from there. One, that one, just because we haven't seen the ayah before this. So continuing on from there, they will find out. Dot dot dot. Okay. When? So they will find out when, with iron collars and chains around their necks, they are dragged. Well, the sentence doesn't even end there. They are dragged where? They are dragged into scalding water and then burned in the fire. Sentence is still not done. And asked, where now are those you called upon? But the sentence isn't over. Called upon besides God. They will say they have abandoned us. Those we called upon before were really nothing at all. This is how God lets disbelievers go astray. All because on earth you reveled in untruth and ran wild. So you can see already how the sentence structure it does not really correspond with the ayah endings. So a question, why are there ayah ends at these particular places? So let's just look at one of these. Um, so if you look at one, two, three, four, number four here. So and asked, where now are those you called upon? So what is the benefit of me stopping there instead of just reading the whole sentence? Where are now where now are those you called upon besides God? Which one is more powerful? If you ask me, if you give me a general question, where are those you called upon? That's very powerful. You don't even have to say the next part. It's mentioned. It will clarify it. But that general question is just so powerful. So there's this interesting wisdom in where the pauses took place. And these pauses, as we'll see in the next slide, these pauses come from the Prophet ﷺ and where he would pause when he would recite the Qur'an. And that's what the Sahaba, they, tried, they noted down in their written copies of the Qur'an, they would note down where the Prophet ﷺ would stop. And so we've also received the ayah ends from the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Another example of this, and this is some, a surah that many of us are probably familiar with, Surah Al-Ma'un, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ If you look at the translation of this ayah, it actually sounds really weird and like wrong. Like, woe to those who pray. Cursed be those who pray. That does not sound like what we're expecting to hear. Right? There's a little bit of a shock factor there. And then you're like, oh, wait, everyone who prays is like cursed by Allah? But then Allah clarifies. Those who are forgetful regarding them. Those who are forgetful in their prayer. Those who are forgetful about their prayer. They don't care about their prayers that much. When prayer time comes in, they're like, oh, I guess I'll do it after I finish my work. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. But at the beginning, it catches your attention. It's like, okay, I want to know what, who are these people praying? I pray. Am I one of those people? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is cursing here. So I get worried. And so I read on and try to find the benefit in it. So this is some of the you know, the subtle wisdoms in where the ayahs end, even if the sentence is not completed. Okay, so going back to the organization levels that come from the Prophet ﷺ's time, the Quran is divided into surahs, surahs is divided into ayahs. So let's look at ayahs really briefly. Who determined the ayahs? like where they ended, these are transmitted to us from the Sahaba, from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba would mark ayah markers, something to indicate that the ayah had ended, based on where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pause when he would recite the Qur'an, either in prayer or outside of the prayer. Uh, there's actually five different ayah marking systems that are transmitted to us. Two from the city of Medina, one from Mecca, one from Kufa, one from Basra, one from the Sham area. The reason why there's five of these is, uh, is one of the other you know, discussions, inshallah, we'll have in a future lecture, is about the writing of the Qur'an. So the Qur'an was written in the time of Uthman, 
and five copies of it were made, and they were sent to different areas. Now, the Maya markers, different Sahaba were listening to the Prophet in different times. So they maintained those in the different Mus'hafs, in the different Qur'ans. And so the people of that area would then transmit the way that the ayahs were marked in that type of Mus'haf. And so they have different systems. They're not conflicting with each other. Uh, there are no extra ayahs in one or missing ayahs in another. It's just a matter of like, this, this uh, system here marks this whole thing as one ayah, the other one marks it as two ayahs. Because maybe one time the Prophet saw a paused in the middle of the ayah. And so another Sahabi wrote that down as, a, as an ayah. And one Sahabi heard it at a different time when the Prophet recited it all at once. Um, an example of this is in um, Surah Al-Nas. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ This is one ayah. But in the counting system that comes to us from Sham and Damascus area, this is actually two ayahs. It's, so if you're reciting according to that, it would be min sharril waswas. Another ayah, al khannas, a separate ayah. And so you have things like this throughout the Quran, minor variations of where exactly the pause marks are, but the ayahs are the same. The words are exactly the same. And so that's the main point that we're getting out of this. All right. And why are there minor differences? We talked about this. The Prophet ﷺ could have stopped differently in different occasions. Or the Sahaba made their best effort at determining the stopping points based on the Prophet's recitation. And some people heard it here, some people heard it here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But again, it's all being transmitted from the time of the Sahaba. Now we go up to the surahs. Who determined the surahs? Well, we have very clear narrations from the Prophet ﷺ and from the Sahaba talking about how every time there would be revelation that came to the Prophet ﷺ, he would call the scribes. And, you know, for example, one of the scribes was Zayd ibn Sa'bat anhu. So he would call the scribe and he would tell them to come. And then the Prophet ﷺ would recite the ayah and he would say, put this ayah in that surah, in that place, after this ayah. So he would dictate where exactly that ayah goes. And now why is this narration informative for us? Because something that we might have heard before, something that we know as a fact, is that the first revelation to the Prophet ﷺ was what? Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Is that the first surah of the Qur'an? No. But there's no contradiction, there's no problem there, because the order in which the Qur'an was revealed is not the order in which Allah wanted it to be preserved for the rest of eternity. There was a particular wisdom in the Qur'an being revealed that way. But there's a particular wisdom in the rest of humanity for the rest of time reading the Qur'an in this way, the way that it is now. And so the Prophet ﷺ determined which surahs would have which ayahs, what the order of the ayahs would be within each surah. As verses were being revealed, the Prophet ﷺ would tell the scribes to place each verse in a particular place. Then we go to the ordering of the surahs next to each other. Like why is Surah Al-Fatiha first and then Surah Al-Baqarah and then Ali Imran and Nisa? So who determined this? So there's actually two different opinions among the scholars. One is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam determined it as part of like, you know, those narrations that he had of put this ayah in this surah next to this other ayah. So he's also determining which surah would be where. We have several narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioning the, the surahs in order, the way that we still have them preserved in our mushaf, which seems to indicate that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam determined the ordering of the surahs. However, we do have a couple of uh, narrations uh, in which the the Sahaba said that after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, we knew the order of all of the surahs except for Surah At-Tawbah. We didn't know where to put it. And we, we had a sense that the Prophet ﷺ wanted us to put it after Surah Al-Anfal, but we weren't sure. And so because of that incident and a few other narrations, some of the, some of the scholars said that this was actually the Sahaba's effort and what was the right way to do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, it's possible that these two are simply just, you know, differences of like expression. Um, and they're actually talking about the same idea. The Prophet ﷺ had left how it should be. Um, it should be organized. But maybe there were a couple of details here and there that the Sahaba figured out. But from the Sahaba to this day, the Qur'an has been organized in this exact same way. 114 surahs, beginning to end of the Qur'an. And that's how the entire ummah has received it. Um, all right. So that brings us to the end of um, all the topics that we had to discuss. Uh, these are some of the further readings if you guys are interested in uh, reading more about this topic and other topics in this 
science, which is called Ulum al-Qur'an, the Qur'anic sciences, the sciences of the Qur'an. These are some of the resources that are available in English. Um, I listed the same list last, uh, last time I came in January as well. Uh, but again, a, there's a lot of benefit in these sources. Uh, the Quran and Eternal Challenge by Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah Daraz, is a very unique book that was written in the past century by this scholar from Egypt, who his educational journey was very interesting. He studied traditionally, and then he did his PhD in France, um, and he wrote his uh, his PhD uh, research dissertation on the Quran and why the Quran is miraculous. And he talks about some of the elements that I talked about today, about the miraculousness of the Qur'an and the eloquence of the Qur'an. He discusses some of these things in that book. Uh, the next two books are an approach to the Qur'anic sciences and an introduction to the sciences of the Qur'an are general books in English that introduce these different topics and many other topics as well. Uh, the Ibn Ashur Center for Qur'anic Studies is run by my teacher, Sheikh Suhaib. Um, has a lot of uh, publications that come out, a lot of videos on YouTube. If you're interested in more discussions, detailed discussions about some of these types of topics, uh, about tafsir, about uh, element, uh, features of the Qur'an, etc., etc. And Yaqeen Institute also has a lot of very um, useful research papers and uh, detailed discussions in English from which uh, a lot can be learned. Some of these uh, scholars that I've mentioned here by name, they have specific papers that they've discussed the Qur'an in on Yaqeen Institute's website. So that's all the content uh, for today, inshallah. Um, if anyone has any questions or any comments, inshallah, we'd be happy to hear those. Any questions, thoughts before we close for today? Nope. All right. Well, either I did a really good job or I did a really bad job. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people of the Quran and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of, the, all of our efforts. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, we can talk. Yeah, no, that's fine. We can talk about general question. As long as it's related to the Quran. It's about learning Arabic. Sure. Talk about um, it. What resources would you like suggest for learning Arabic? Um, that's a very, very good question. Um, so Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of resources now in the English language. Um, so we have a couple of institutes that teach Arabic. Um, for example, we have Bayina Institute that teaches Arabic. Um, if somebody's trying, if you're trying to do full-time Arabic, like you might take a gap year or something and then do full-time Arabic, a, good, a great program is the Qalam Institute uh, program, the Arabic program there. Um, if you're trying to do something part-time, uh, we at Kitab Academy teach Arabic classes as well. We have part-time classes twice a week usually. And if somebody wants to do a different, like a higher or lower frequency, they can do one-on-one -on -one classes as well. We have a lot of teachers that teach Arabic. So uh, I would say Kitab Academy, um, Qalam Institute, Bayina Institute are three uh, common. But are there any self-paced If you programs? want a self-paced course, let me think. Um... I don't know of any self-paced Quranic Arabic online courses at the moment. Bayina has some self-paced, right? Okay, yeah, so Bayina Institute might have some self-paced stuff, yeah. So do you mind repeating all of the programs one more time? Yeah, yeah so Bayina Institute, uh, Qalam Institute, and Kitab Academy. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question over here. MashaAllah, she's inspired me to have some confidence to ask. So JazakAllah khair for your talk. I, I learned a lot, took a, a lot of notes. Um, how do you, what would you recommend for someone who's can't study this full time? You know, uh, that someone is me. Let's say you're just trying to read the Quran, you know, sometime during the week mm -hmm. in Arabic and then um, reading the translation. I have a tafsir um, set, but connecting that like you need a lot of time to spread all those books out if you're doing it on your own right. what can we do to take just a, the next step yeah. to uh, what would it be what would be the next step be yeah this is a very very good question I mean the, the resources that I have on the screen there are a little bit more like if you wanted to you know spend some time going through a book or something that you could take some one of these books and go through it slowly um, one other thing that uh, as you were asking the question I thought of so um, Sheikh Suhaib, the one whose name is on the on the screen as well, he works with uh, Quran.com, 
And there's, a, there's an institute or there's another website called QuranReflect.com. So QuranReflect.com is connected to Quran.com. And if you go to Quran.com and you search up an ayah, there's actually a reflect button. And so you see other people's reflections on that ayah. So something that Quran Reflect has uh, released in the past, I think last Ramadan they released this, is something called the Quran Calendar. Uh, and the, I think it's called the Quran Calendar. I can double check that. Um, but I think it's called the Quran Calendar. And so what that is, is uh, for the Quran Calendar, there's a particular reading, particular reading of the translation, particular reading of tafsir that is assigned for each week as sort of like your goal. And then there are um, from time to time, Shia Suhaib, has, he releases these like one-hour discussions with a few people sitting in a, in, a, in a studio with him and having a discussion on those ayat that like, then gets like published and then released. So the Quran calendar, I would say, is a good place to go. Uh, Bayina Institute is also another place to go because uh, Ustad Noman and other scholars who teach through there, uh, they go into more depth about the Quran and they'll go ayah by ayah and go into sort of like an exploration of all the meanings. So those are two places that I would recommend. Um, yeah, and then if you, if you wanted to take classes, for example, then um, Qalam Institute has a, is something called the Qalam Academy that has uh, part-time evening classes for, for adults and for um, uh, people who just want to study a little bit more but don't have a lot of time. And so they have those classes. Uh, if you want to study Arabic, then Kitab Academy also has Arabic classes as well. Uh, well, it's based in the Bay Area, kind of. It's based in California. I, I'm in San Jose. Um, Arham, who's the founder of Kitab Academy, lives in uh, SoCal. There's no physical location for Kitab Academy at the moment. Uh, we are currently exploring certain options with certain masjids to um, provide in person, but we haven't um, offered anything in person yet. Uh, most of our students have been, you know, working professionals who are just very busy. They have, you know, agree to take a one and a half hour twice a week and study with um, online and which is usually more convenient for a lot of young yeah, working professionals anyways um, because they have children or they have other responsibilities etc so it's easier for them that way but uh, we are considering and open to in-person things as well inshallah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, there's no problem with the tajjud is like easy like whatever you want to do whatever you're able to do inshallah there's no problem with it as all at all if you want to do like the the highly recommended amount that that process them to date but there's no problem with like the numbers like it's, it's more about like doing it yeah and being consistent with it yeah There's no problem with that, inshallah. These are all these are all extra extra acts of worship. Uh, just like focus all the energy into like the next night you do it. You try to be a little bit more focused. You know, work on like uh, your sleep, maybe whatever is like the the thing that prevented you from being able to touch it one night. Work on those things. Don't worry too much about if you miss one night, two nights, whatever. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala is. I mean, these are all extra things, anyways. This is not like the pillars. Those things we have to make up. Uh, if you are able to do it, you should do it. If you are not, if it's difficult, then don't do it. If you're, you know, it's like a lot of travel, you're tired, then don't worry about it. Yeah. There's a lot of ease associated with travel. Uh, even like our, our part of the prayer becomes shorter. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to be easier for us when we're traveling. Yeah. All right. Jazakumullah khairan everyone. Barakallahu feekum. I appreciate all of you coming out, staying for this long. Are there any questions online? Okay. Oh, you can put it, I guess, here. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it, inshallah. All right, Jazakum Al-Khair and everyone for coming out, spending so much time here. Uh, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you all from the people of the Qur'an and people who ab absorb the Qur'an into your souls. Jazakum Allah Al-Khair and subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.